Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back. In this session, we'll talk about the computational procedure or the process and also a little bit about conceptualization which uh, involves concepts. And uh, then we will try to see perception as a computational procedure and how it is produced. Uh, as I said, we are trying to rediscover uh, the Indian philosophy, the classical Indian philosophy or uh, Indian logic through the glass of cognitive science. So, uh, And also we are exploring, we are trying to see whether we get some guidance from the Indian principles or the Indian methods. We see that uh, there are similarities between the approach of classical Indian philosophers and that of the cognitive scientists. So all of them, as I said, that all of them uh, all of them have a lot of, uh, all of them think, all of them consider that representation, process and concept are very important aspects of, uh, of doing whatever they do uh, in both fields. Now, uh, for us, because concepts are very important, conceptualization itself and also the logic of conceptualization uh, these two things also become very, very important. A philosopher has many assumptions because their job is different, slightly different, I would say. Some of their assumptions are taken as granted, but not all those assumptions would be accepted by a cognitive scientist because we need to check the, the, the very process of conceptualization of those assumptions. One such assumption is this... Uh, thing which uh, I have uh, mentioned here, this anulikyamana uh, jati akhando padhinam swarupato bhanam. This principle, I'm sorry I cannot translate it word by word because that will be very very difficult and, it, and time consuming at the same time. But I would like to uh, share uh, with you the sense of it, what it is trying to do. And then, uh, once again, not as such, not, not the principle as such, because it is difficult, but the essence of it can be split into different questions and different answers to those very questions. And we are trying to do that. How to conceptualize this principle, which basically says, if you want a very rough translation, this basically says that a universal, a universal is kind of a property it's an abstract property, something like potness or potnessness. A universal, when a universal is not mentioned verbally in the verbalization of a cognition, it appears, it auto appears in the cognition. Uh, it means something very significant, as I said. We will try to explore the significance of it. Uh, and we split this issue first into two questions. And then we try to answer those questions. Uh, let us compare two different cognitions. One is just an apple. I cognize an apple. The other one is I cognize Dick as an apple possessor. That is, Dick is an apple possessor. What does that mean? Now, uh, we may notice that in the first, we, uh, we can just concentrate on uh, this area. And it depends. We can just concentrate on this area. We are uh, the, 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 the qualifiedness, right? Here, the qualifiedness has one and only one limiting aspect, which is a relation. But in this case, the qualifiedness has got two different limiting aspects. One is contact, the other one is appleness. Why so? Why is this disparity? We'll try to explain that. Uh, 
yeah that's the thing uh, so those two are highlighted the point is you see an apple is always an apple right it always has appleness that way an apple is ever limited by appleness but not that all the time it's a qualifier it's a qualifier only when it qualifies something not otherwise what happens when it becomes a qualifier it acquires it gains a property called qualifierness this is very very important how is this gaining how is I, I, I'm sorry I don't have right words to describe this how is this becoming what is this gaining a new property which is an adventitious, adventitious property which is contingent not that it is essential to an apple not that it all the time has to be there uh, in the hand of uh, deck right uh, in the hands of deck or whatever it is not compulsory for it but it is completely contingent when it becomes a qualifier for tech, say through the relation of in of contact or whatever, what happens? It gains qualifierness. Now, qualifierness is the emergent property it has, right? This qualifierness is it. This qualifierness or prakarata must be found. We are not talking about the prakara, which is the apple. That means the, the, the qualifier, which is the apple in this case. We are talking about this emergent, this adventitious or contingent property that is gained by, that is attained by this apple, right? What is it? That is prakarata. How is this property gained? It is gained, uh, we read this part. Now, uh, appleness gains qualifiedness while being related to the apple through inherence. Appleness is just one thing that does not allow multiplicity of cognitions. Now, apple, so what is the what is the qualifier here? Appleness. Appleness does not really have many different properties uh, like the apple has, right? Because uh, it is just one thing, appleness, and it's enough to describe it. It is kind of irreducible. You cannot uh, split it into different properties and all that. It doesn't have... Uh, the multiplicity of properties which is very very important there is one avenue it has appleness ness which is not very relevant here because anyway it is appleness we this is kind of a kind of a stoppage this is kind of a blind lane you you arrive at uh, at a at an abstract property which is a universal here that is appleness and you stop because you don't have uh, the as I said, once again, I emphasize on this because it's a very, very important point. This is a conceptual point, uh, which is almost like assumed in, in the Nyaya framework, but not for us. Not for us who want to analyze, who want to understand each and every assumption of the Indian philosopher, right? So for us, we that's why. Now, because appleness is one property, which which is not a lot of things, right? It is just a property that's it and uh, so it it, it 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 participates in the process as a property nothing more than that we don't then go to the next abstract level because we don't want we don't have to but at the same time appleness allows multiple relations right why does it allow multiple relations simply because look how many relations uh, it involves it is related to itself through identity because it is identical to itself. It is there in an apple through inherence that is samavaya. Therefore, there is multiplicity of relations as far as the appleness is concerned. So, because there are different avenues and the cognition has chosen one, what is it it has chosen? It has chosen, it has presented, the cognition has presented appleness under the mode of inherence. That is why here only inherence becomes uh, the the limiting factor for for the qualifiedness that resides in appleness, right? But that is not the case here. That is that is not the case in as far as this uh, uh, this cognition is concerned. That is, deck is an apple possessor. Here, 
this qualifiness, which resides in the apple, which is the qualifier, has got two limiting aspects or factors. One, a relation, and the other one, uh, 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 the property, appleness. It is because the apple acquires or gains a qualifiness while having appleness and while being related to dick through contact. Once again, we are not commenting on the qualifier. We are rather commenting on what the thing that is the, which happens to be the qualifier has gained, has attained. It has attained qualifierness, and we are commenting on that. So the qualifierness, the very fact of its attaining, uh, uh, it, its being the qualifier, or the very fact of its attaining qualifierness, is something we are describing. And how does it? How does it acquire or how does it attain qualifiedness? It attains qualifiedness while being related to deck or our qualificant through contact and while having under the mode. So there are two modes under which its qualifiedness is represented, right? Uh, in the knowledge, in the knowledge window. And one of them is a relation, which is contact in this case, and the other one is a property. That is, that is, um, Apple-ness, because it is not participating in the cognition uh, as something having fruitness or causeness or effectness, but it is participating in the cognition uh, as being something that has Apple-ness, right? So these two, both, because there, there, there is multiplicity of relations and also there is multi multiplicity of properties so it can go go any way because it can go it can go any path the the, the cognition chooses two specific paths in this case uh, why the relations are many because once again it is uh, that is uh, apple and apple is identical to itself and apple is in contact uh, with dick and apple is say it's it's a property of of tom dick's uh, twin brother and uh, so it so propertyhood is under the relationship right through which or ownerhood so in i'm not getting into it but practically if you analyze it according to the nyaya uh, framework uh, the apple when it is a property of tom it is related to tom through the relation called ownerhood or ownerness uh, that is swamitwa so it has got various relations one of them is chosen by the cognition. What is it? That is contact. So there are two different things while there is just one thing here. So I thought I should clarify it and then we want to see a pictorial presentation of that. Now remember we are not snatching this apple from Dick. Let it be there. This is a different apple and this is a different apple and this is Tom uh, Dick's brother who owns the apple but that's a different thing here. We are not showing that relationship and he doesn't have uh, this apple he is like so the apple is not in contact with this uh, as we know that uh, dick is the qualificant the apple is the qualifier and uh, contact is the relation the main relation between the two here and uh, look also compare this apple to this apple now uh, this has got appleness so yes appleness is a qualifier because appleness distinguishes the apple all the time but uh, but 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 qualifierness does not distinguish the apple all the time. So it does not that is qualifierness does not reside in the apple all the time. But in this case it does. So uh, when the apple has qualifierness, it has got two more tags, right? Two more things are distinguishing this very special property. Just now this apple has attained. Suppose just before one second, uh, Dick held the the apple so just just one second ago so just now this apple has gained uh, this property called qualifiedness it's a new gains it's a new gained property and it has got two different distinguishers or tags one is contact because through that the apple is there in deck and also appleness right the the property the property limiter so it has got two limiters uh, a relation limiter and a property limiter right and that's very very important for us. Uh, now uh, we may try to see 
a few other things. I don't know how much we can cover uh, in our session, but we need to talk about those. By using the techniques we have already learned, basically the representation technique, because now we'll go to the process. Before that, we need to analyze a few things. We can describe different types of cognitions now. For example, first, we talk about knowledge. Knowledge, we take the typical platonic formulation of that, although that has been uh, that has been sort of refuted by by Gettier and others. Uh, we still stick to that uh, because it's easy to understand. So a knowledge, a piece of knowledge is a justified true belief. Now, in our case, we call uh, knowledge a valid cognition or prama. What is prama? According to Ganesha, Ganesha is the, the pioneer of this neologic we are talking about. Ganesha says, Tadvati tat prakar ka anubhavaha prama. Once again, I give a rough translation of that, but it is somehow reliable. A cognition C is valid if and only if the property X that appears as the qualifier of C really belongs to the qualificant of C. What does it mean? It means the following. So, once again, the naive pre philosophical picture you see an apple. You see an object that has appleness, and you cognize this is an apple. So uh, once again, this is a philosophical picture of it, right? That is here. You have this trial, uh, apple, the the uh, property relation, property holder trial, and here you have the qualifier, qualificant, and cognitive connection trial, and there is a mapping which you can see very easily. And uh, in this case, you can see that really. So what is the property that is appearing as the qualifier uh, in, the, in the cognition? It is actually appleness. And appleness really belongs to the thing that is somehow captured as this, right? The, the object right in front of me, the property holder. Because in reality, in, because in the cognition, appleness belongs to uh, the object that has been captured as this. Also in reality, that property which is appearing as the qualifier in the cognition belongs to the, the, the entity that is appearing as this or the meaning of this, right? So because uh, there is that correspondence, the real uh, belongingness is there and that is supported by the real world because of that, this cognition, that is uh, the cognition having uh, this as the qualificant and appleness as the qualifier, this cognition is valid because this holds. Now, erroneous cognition or Brahma or uh, an incorrect cognition, a Brahma. A cognition C is, is erroneous uh, if the property X that appears as the qualifier of C does not belong to the qualificant of C. That is, the qualificant of C has the absence of X. It is once again understandable. Tad abhavavati, tad prakar ka anubhavaha is a Brahma, right? It's an illusion. So this is an analysis of an illusion. So you see this object, which has pepperness, and you cognize this is an apple. Now, what is the philosophical analysis of it? The tagged picture. This is the tagged picture of it. So you have the qualificant, which is this, and you have appleness as the qualifier. But the property which appears as the qualifier, that is appleness, does not really belong to uh, to the thing that appears as this, right? Because it doesn't have appleness. So it has the absence of appleness. Although ap all apple appleness appears as the qualifier in the cognition. That is the reason this cognition is invalid. So this way validity is kind of, um, it's not a real correspondence, like not in a very, uh, very perfect sense, but it, it, it's somehow something like correspondence between the real picture and the cognitive picture. And then there is a doubt. What is a doubt? It's a cognition having several contrary keywords. What is contrariety? Contrariety is a property we'll talk about. So for example, uh, uh, is it an apple or a pepper? Is a doubt. Or somehow you think that maybe it is an apple or maybe a pepper. That also is a doubt. So you see something, you don't know what it is. And then you think, is it an apple or is it a pepper, right? So this is a doubt. What happens in this? You see, in this case, 
you have uh, the qualificantness which is there in this and this qualificantness has got two different qualifiers one resides in pepiness and one i actually i am uh, i'm sorry there should be a small correction i need not uh, i need not talk about pepinessness at all here so i i i cancel uh, not not this one not this one but uh, not this one but uh, i cancel uh, I scratched this out, so we don't need this applenessness. It is enough that we talk about uh, a qualifiedness that is there in appleness and another. You remember that uh, once you reach an abstract level, that is the level of appleness. You don't need another. So I, by mistake, I I put this. I don't know how because I'm uh, doing many slides in almost no time. This is a bad time, so we need to give courses. We need to offer courses. Uh, that's why we are also making mistakes. Okay, so we are talking about uh, the qualifierness that is there in pepiness and the qualifierness that is there in appleness. And both, both these contrary qualifiernesses do somehow determine the qualificantness in this, right? This is how you describe a doubt with contrary qualifiers, right? Now, what is contrariety? Two things are contrary when the presence of one guarantees the absence of the other, although the absence of one does not guarantee the presence of the other. So if something is an apple, definitely it's not a pepper. It guarantees the absence of pepperhood, but and also vice versa. But if it is not a pepper, there is no guarantee that it's an apple. It can be anything else. It can be a mango or something else, right? This thing is called, this relation is called contrariety. So uh, a doubt now can be uh, can be can be defined as a cognition that has the qualificantness having two contrary qualifiers, two or more. It can be more also. We need to talk about uh, the notation system, uh, and also by using that, I need to correct uh, a mistake just now I have made. The problem is we cannot get back. Uh, to the old recording and edit it so I am just giving corrections so please uh, stay with me I'm making mistakes on the slides but then I would correct anyways we need to talk about the notation because uh, we need to understand we need to add a little more clarity I'm sure that we understand it most of us do understand it uh, we understand how it works but a little more so uh, I when I designed this notation system I did not think of uh, any systematic uh, thing or anything. I just thought of uh, having precision and brevity because uh, the Nyaya phrases are very huge, very long. They take a very, uh, they, they take a lot of time. So I wanted to have brevity sort of this notation. Uh, now, in uh, in one of the previous slides, I said that this was I not that I said I typed this as. Uh, as uh, as limited which is not correct so i corrected this actually is determined so and uh, then we describe it so the point is a bracketed phrase always describes the last entity so so here imagine that there is a bracket the last brackets in our in most of the conventional systems uh, is normally not visible it is uh, it is invisible so imagine this th there is this last bracket and this is the uh, the last element of the last bracket so basically this whole phrase describes this element which is a cognition how is that cognition now there are describers for that cognition now this is a cognition having uh, this qualificantness right this uh, Visheshyata, which uh, resides in this. This means this italicized this is uh, the object which somebody sees just in front of them. So, um, so this is the the reference of that uh, reference of the word this. So then, so this describes first this one describes this, right? And then this once again is being described uh, once again by two phrases at the same time. There. They, they they belong to the equal level this so there are two determinants or rather there are two determiners and this is determined by two different 
properties, two different qualifier nesses. One is uh, this one, which uh, resides in Pepiness. So if this is one, then yeah, this is the first one that determines this one. And also the second one is uh, this, uh, this determiner that is another qualifier ness, uh, not getting ness because it is there. It is broken. So I'm just so imagine ness is there. So this also is uh, sorry. So this also is is describing this, right? So uh, here is the first thing which is being described by a being described means this is being defined in terms of this qualificant ness, and then this qualificant ness is defined or described in terms of two uh, same level. Uh, same level qualifier nesses. One resides in paperness, the other one resides in appleness. This is how we uh, we look at it. So, uh, and then another property, another uh, feature of this notation system is, despite being simple, it is it is powerful. You you can almost uh, describe anything in this system. And uh, so that's how I, I didn't think of uh, coming up with a proper notation system, but it so happens that uh, the thing I have come up with is somehow okay, is powerful to describe most of the Nyaya ideas. And uh, the third thing I must say that uh, that uh, this, the system we are using here, it represents the Nyaya phrases as they are, the Sanskrit Nyaya phrases without any other agenda. Now, there are great papers, great works by very good scholars who wanted to use uh, different Western calculi. So they used predicate calculus, they used lambda calculus, they used Beeler's property logic. But, uh, and and the, the, the results were very great, but I observed perhaps there was some incompatibility because all these calculi had their own philosophical agendas, which uh, all the time are not compatible with the Nyaya assumptions. So sometimes that is problematic. I just wanted to avoid that. So I wanted to come up with a notation system that follows the, the Nyaya notation system exactly. So I think here is one which can do that. We will see the descriptive power of this notation system. Okay, so uh, now we go to the next topic which is causal mechanism. And uh, why do we need this? Because a process, uh, an epistemic process, epistemology we know is the study of knowledge. An epistemic, epistemic process is kind of a causal process also. Uh, there is a causal tendency. It's a very predominant tendency in, in Indian philosophy that uh, Everything is somehow defined in terms of cause and effect relations and uh, other causal stuff. So we need to understand the theory of causation and uh, mostly this is the theory of causation uh, most philosophical schools would, uh, would adopt. So what is a cause? First we define a cause and an effect. So, and uh, one another thing, it's an ontological law, that is, it's a law of the physical world. It is a law that operates in the outside world, and uh, that means it, it operates, uh, it, it applies to uh, non-cognitive uh, objects, right? So, now we go to the definition, which is uh, like this. Uh, we say that E factors C1 through Cn regularly precede the production of E. Every CI is a cause for E. Cause is karana and effect is karya. Now, uh, so, and th th these are technical Sanskrit terms. So, regularly, pre regularly precedent factor is niyata purvavarti. So, uh, now we can see that uh, we will uh, we'll consider this. So, but there is a problem. We said that we consider the set of factors that regularly precede the production of E. Now, you can see that the potter's grandfather must regularly precede the potter in all cases, right? So everywhere you have, a, you, have you see the potter, definitely uh, the, the, the origin of the potter <laughs> was preceded by the potter's grandfather. Had the grandfather not been there, the potter would never exist. The question is, is the potter's grandfather a cause for the potter? The intuitive answer is no, not really. It means you don't need the the potter 
to uh, to be there when the the uh, po the potter's grandfather to be there when the potter is born, right? So then we need uh, an additional requirement. What is it? Suppose L is the list of factors that cause E. If both X and Y are on L and if X causes Y, that does not cause E immediately, that is there is a temporal gap between Y and E, then X's causal role is established otherwise and we call this anyatha siddha. That being the case, X is not a cause for E despite regularly preceding E. So yes, if a factor just regularly precedes E, it does not become a cause for E. Why not? We'll talk about it. Uh, X is a cause for E if and only if. So this is kind of, uh, it's a quasi formal definition, but it works. I think uh, we cannot uh, qualify it anymore. We don't have time for doing that, but we actually could do that. X is a cause for E if and only if X regularly precedes the production of E and this is the additional qualification, X is not established otherwise for E. The Porter's grandfather directly causes the Porter's father. And it is not the case that the moment the Porter's father is born, the Porter too is born. There is a temporal gap between uh, the, the, the Porter's father and the Porter. The Porter's father does not trigger a chain reaction, a causal chain reaction. So that is the reason that uh, I wanted to say, yeah, yeah, this is pretty good. But then we also could say that the Porter's grandfather does not trigger a chain reaction. That is, it is not the case that grandfather immediately father and the Potter. It doesn't happen that way. So, uh, so once again, we analyze it a bit more. Uh, suppose T and O are on the list, but this is another story altogether, where the causation is pretty much, the causation looks pretty much like the grandfather case, but not really. There is a difference. So we are talking about that difference. And this is a real causal scenario where every factor matters. How is it? Suppose T and O are on the list of factors that regularly precede the production of E. T houses O in a sense that uh, O is sheltered in T, O is uh, located in T. E happens immediately after O is produced. This is the difference between the grandfather case and uh, this case, that it uh, that uh, E happens, e, e immediately follows E. That story is called, that or rather that feature is called a yoga vyavachinna, a yoga vyavacheda. We would say that in that case, O is a yoga vyavachinna for E. Now, O is called the causal operation, T is called the causal instrument. We need to understand this through uh, examples. Now, consider this, the axe, at the contact between the axe and the tree are on the list of the regularly precedent factors for felling the tree. We understand that. Here, the contact is a dynamic contact. It is something like uh, uh, applying the axe, uh, if you put it that way, to the, to the tree. It is uh, taking the axe very close or sort of attacking the tree with the axe. This is the dynamic contact. The axe houses the contact, right? Because if uh, the the contact has to be housed. It must be housed in the uh, in the axe itself. The tree is felled immediately after the dynamic contact is established. Not that you attack the tree right now. I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is, when your attack is sufficient, you sufficiently attack the tree right now, and the tree falls after ten minutes. No, it doesn't happen that way. It happens immediately. The contact is the causal operation for felling the tree. So remember the yoga vyavachinna karana, the karana which immediately precedes the production of the effect. In our case, it is the felling of the tree. So uh, the, that cause becomes the vyapara or the causal operation and the house of that cause becomes the causal instrument or karana. So here in our case, it is the axe. Uh, we need to just see a pictorial presentation of that. Now look here. Um, here is uh, here is a tree and uh, here is an axe and uh, yes the causal instrument is pretty much there but even then the tree is not felled simply because the operation the causal operation is not produced now what is the causal operation it is this movement it comes here the moment it comes here it, it attacks the tree sufficiently the tree falls right so look at once again look at the chronology of it 
here is it nothing would happen as so although it's a trigger although this thing the axe is the trigger for the whole thing it it does not trigger without having the causal operation it triggers the whole procedure yes it is the trigger but it triggers the whole procedure only only through the vyapara or the causal operation which is this and then immediately after that it falls now look how different it is from the grandfather case in the case of the grandfather so the gra grandfather uh, causes the 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 father but immediately after that the potter is not born so there is a temporal gap and you don't know how long and there is no regular thing and then some after some some years i don't know maybe 25 years 30 years the potter is born and because of that you can't say that uh, in this case the grandfather although it looks very similar grandfather father potter here also you can see the axe the contact and the felling of the tree they look very similar but they're not similar because because of this uh, yoga vyavacheda in this case you find this immediate uh, causation right this immediacy that uh, the moment so it happens this way but in the case of the grandfather it's not like that so so th therefore the axe in this case is the causal instrument the karana and the 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 contact is the vyapara now we need to see remember we said that the computational process the computational procedure is very very important as far as cognitive science is concerned you represent something and what do you do with the representation if no process is uh, is done with the help of those representations the represented things must interact with each other to do to make some other representation and that is what you are looking at right now here is the process and uh, cognitive psychologists and uh, of course cognitive scientists but mainly psychologists and philosophers have talked a lot about perception how perception is uh, how perception takes place and all that here is the nyaya account of that i want to i want to show how how well described how systematically described it is by using two things the representations already we have described and the causal theory we have talked about two things are very important here perception has to be seen as both an effect and a process first effect how is it an effect consider one case say some some kind of perceptual activity so what is the causal instrument here a sense organ it can be anything an eye an ear a nose a tongue or skin or anything what is the operation here the operation is the connection between an organ and an object right there so we call in sanskrit indriya artha sanikarsha what is the effect it's a perception either visual or auditory or olfactory or gustatory or tactual some kind of a perception is the result of that now uh, i i just start this topic i don't think we cannot uh, uh, go beyond uh, this because we don't have a lot of space for doing it so i just touch up an attention uh, because it's such an important thing i'll show how attention uh, plays a very important role here so uh, according to the nyaya the nyaya school the mind is atomic both functionally and size wise what does it mean uh, the size thing let us ignore for the time being it is basically irreducible it cannot be split further the mind is one unit that is why it is atomic it is uh, anavika it is atomic and also functionally it is atomic which means that it can do just one unit of things at a time it cannot do two things at a time mind works as a channel between the cognizing self or the atman and the organ the sense organ which is the indriya perception is born only when the self is connected with mind the mind with the organ and the organ with the object in sanskrit this is from tarkasamgaha deepika uh, a canonical text for us atma manasa sanyujyate mana indriyena indriyam arthena tatah pratyaksha jnanam utpatyate 
we see how it happens. Now you see here, here is, uh, here is the subject which is a complex network of different things. One very important thing is there. This is the self of the subject or the Atman where the cognition finally, cognition finally will be born, right? The self. Now here is an object, here is another object, this is a sound and this is a thing and uh, this is an apple or whatever you call it. Uh, but no perception is born because there is no connection. Now let there be connections. So let the the eye be connected with the apple and the ear with the with the music. So even then, even then, no perception will be born because the involvement of mind is still not there. So these are the sannikarchas, the sense object connections. Now the moment uh, the mind creates kind of a channel and the 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 connection becomes perfect. Uh, you create a perfect channel for uh, the, the, the knowledge to take place. What happens is one object is known, not, two, more, not both objects at a time. And then the next moment that connection is broken, another connection is, uh, is established. It is between uh, the, the self, the ear and uh, the musical sound. And then this, uh, this uh, cognition is born. And uh, it is because when we hear something uh, very attentively, we cannot see other things, right? Attention can be explained when the mind is atomic. So it, this is one very important tool, the atomicity of the mind. I'm not saying that it must be the case. Remember, we are, uh, we are trying to make theories. We, we are trying to construct theories so that we understand how things are. So this is one explanation of attention that it attention happens because the mind is atomic, functionally atomic, it cannot do two things at a time. Now the thing is then what about multitasking? Don't we do? Don't we do several things at the same time? So the Nyaya answer to that is we don't. It's an illusion that multitasking happens. What happens is the mind is a very fast instrument. So it operates like this. So uh, all the time, it, it, you can see that it, 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 it operates like that. You can see the, uh, you can actually see the, uh, the what you call the uh, simultaneity of, uh, of, 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 of perception. You think that, uh, yeah, at, there, there is one time when both the music and uh, the, the apple are comprehended or whatever captured, but that's not the truth. That's not the truth. Now, this is like this Alata Chakra. Uh, now, because of this rotation of, uh, of, this, of, of this fire, uh, the illusion of simultaneity is created. Actually, uh, it is not the case. I have collected this picture from, uh, from the internet and here is the source of it. I collected also the picture of Dick and his twin brother, Tom, which you, you can see other pictures I, I had to draw. Uh, by using uh, my computer. So uh, then we go to the next topic, which is basically uh, perception itself. This attention is uh, one thing which is required for that. We are going to analyze cognitions of, of three kinds. Uh, first, it's a case of a valid cognition, which is knowledge in, in Western epistemology then an illusion and then finally it's a very special case of perception it is the perception of absence we start with knowledge uh, we must remember that in cognitive science the representations must be processed and something must come up as a result of that which is another representation that is the achievement, that is the end product of, of a process. Uh, we can see that uh, perhaps the Indian logician, for that case, most of the Indian thinkers, classical Indian philosophers, thinkers, looked at uh, the mind, not the mind, I'm sorry, looked at the, the cognitive system. What they did not know about the brain, uh, mind for them is a very tiny, finny part of it, not, well, if not tiny finny part, it's just a part of it, but mind is not the system. But there is a cognitive system. It's a, a complex network of uh, different things, sense organs, and then the mind, and then different connections, and the object. 
and the self of uh, the subject and all that stuff. This complex net network is the cognitive system or the epistemic system of uh, the subject. This system can be very well understood. So ne they never said that uh, this is this is like a machine, this is like a computer. They never said that. But you can see that, look at the way they would analyze it. It is pretty much compatible with the computational view, uh, with the view that uh, the cognitive system is kind of uh, a machine. It works pretty much mechanically, uh, at least part of it. We are not saying that all of it is mechanical, but at least these things are mechanical. And this is completely uh, causality driven. So there are causes and effects, and then it has very, very well defined rules and steps and everything. We shall see how it works. The first thing, as I said, is a case of knowledge where uh, this entity, uh, the trio, is understood as, uh, as an apple, right? So it is the case of uh, knowing an apple as an apple. So what happens? So at the philosophical level, we know that it's actually a trio of uh, a property holder, a property and a relation in the reality. And then there is some kind of... Uh, some kind of a capture, some kind of a sannikarsha connection. And finally, as a result of that, there is a piece of cognition, which in this case is valid. And we know why it is valid, because in this case, the, uh, the property that appears as the qualifier really belongs, in the reality it belongs, that is appleness. It belongs to the, the property that appears as the qualificant, which is apple. So now, uh, as I said, now we need details of it. This is a very rough uh, representation, gross representation of it, but this uh, does not consider the details of the procedure. Now the details, here is our object complex, the tripartite uh, object complex. And the first sannikarsha or connection that is to be born is the sangyoga sannikarsha, which is basically a contact between the eye the eye means it is not the physical organ, it is the faculty of eye which gets, uh, which somehow reaches the object. And I need to, actually I wanted to say something about this reaching out, but we don't have time. If we can do some other course, then we will talk about it. It is not exactly like how the Western philosophy understands uh, perception, but here it is like that. But I would, I would say that this is not really problematic or this is not really incompatible with any uh, any modern view of perception anyways we are we stick to whatever the ancient philosophers say so then now first of all it is kind of a contact connection that is sangyoga sannikarsha which is established between the sense organ in this case it is the eye and the the property holder the dharmin but that is not enough. And as a result of that, what is captured is just the property holder and nothing else. The property holder now appears as the qualificant in the cognition. Then at the next step, following that cognition, without that, the next level cognition cannot, cannot go ahead. Because the first step is there, the second step. Now, the, the nomenclature is pretty much like uh, chemistry, UPAC nomenclature. So there is inherence here. And there is contact here. Because of contact and inherence, we would call it contacted inherence. So without contact, you could not have contacted inherence. In Sanskrit, this is Sangyukta Samavaya. I didn't give Sanskrit words all the time, but I will I'll tell you what it is. And as a result of that, this thing now, this package rather, is captured. That is the relation which is sang, which is samavaya and also appleness, which was the dharma. So the dharma now appears after having been captured as the qualifier and also the, uh, the relation, but they're not related. So for a few, for, for some moments, or maybe for one moment, they remain unrelated. Why is it so? I will, I'll try to explain their, their theory. So this level, this stage is called the non-relational stage or nirvikalpa pratyaksha. Uh, where all these three elements are separate, unrelated. The next level, now, it will not stay uh, unrelated for too long. They will be eventually related. And then after the relation, 
is established, you call it Savikalpa Pratyaksha or relational perception. So this is the sequence of it. Uh, so the gross picture of that is pretty much like this. There is an apple and uh, you see that as an apple, right? And this is, uh, this is a piece of knowledge and we somehow analyze the genesis of it. See, for each and everything, there is a, there is a connection. Then one thing is born and look at, the, look at the step. We can sort of run it very quickly. We start here. So there is the object. First, the contact connection is born to, to capture the, the property. And then the qualificant is known. Then contacted inherence is born and uh, the whole thing happens. Now, uh, there are many other things actually we, uh, we could be saying, but not here, about these connections. This, we have not talked about all connections. There are many other connections, uh, sense object connections in, in Nyaya, uh, which we may not discuss now. Uh, now we need to talk about a few assumptions of this Nyaya system. Why is it that there is kind of a non-relational stage before the relational stage. It is because uh, they assume that the cause of the cognition of the qualified or the related uh, object, that is Vishishta, so the, the, uh, such, a, such a cognition is called Vishishta Buddhi. The cause of such a Vishishta Buddhi is the separate cognitions of the qualifier and the qualificant. So how do we, why should we say that? We say that because if you do not know an apple and dig separately, you never know dick with an apple. In order to know dick with an apple, in order to know this complex, this object complex, you need to first understand dick and apple separately. So the same, by extension, uh, the same model applies uh, to the case of perception that uh, for some moment or maybe for one moment, the three contents remain unrelated. Then they get related. Now, the, it, it's very important, not that every time the Nayaikas spell out everything so clearly, but it's our job to, to spell out their assumptions. And, uh, and also, we need to check, we need to see whether they're ungrounded or not. I think they're pretty much grounded. So one idea is a cognition has a glue that will eventually relate contents captured separately. It, they will not remain unrelated. Both physical and physical laws such as causation and mental laws such as this glue thing and so many others operate in the cognitive world. This is another very, very important thing which normally the philosophers do not talk about so explicitly, but we must make it, uh, we must make it explicit that the cognitive world has its own exclusive laws like the glue, the glue law that uh, separate contents will not remain separate eventually they'll be glued up. And then there are so many others. Uh, but also the physical law of causation applies to this world. That is, there would be kind of a karana, a kind of a causal instrument, which is in this case, the, the sense organ. And then there would be also a vyapara or an operation. In this case, uh, that is the connection, the establishment of the connection. This is also dynamic because in this model, the, the, the sense reaches out to the object. So the next topic is illusion, Brahma. For this, we need to understand another connection. We have done uh, a few connections. We have studied a few ordinary connections, which are called uh, Laukika Sannikarshas. But we need now to study a few Laukika Sannikarshas, which are extraordinary. One such extraordinary connection is something I call the cognition-only cognition connection or jnana lakshana pratyasati. This is something many scholars have translated it, it differently. I call it cognition-only and uh, Professor Arindam Chakrabarti calls it uh, through memory awareness. So there are many different ways to look at it, but I have taken almost a literal meaning jnanam lakshanam yasya, which is nothing but the cognition itself. It's a connection, but it's basically a cognition. How it operates? Suppose the subject has a memory of X. Now the subject sees Y, which is somehow like X. But in this case, somehow the subject uh, cannot see the special features of Y and sees features that are both that are common to both X and Y. In this case, what happens? So it the, the subject 
the, or the cognitive system of the subject cannot really capture the special feature of why. In that case, now one, one very important principle, I forgot to type it, but I, I spell it out here, is no cognition allows any gap. Even, even if it cannot capture something in the real world, it will supply the system with that. It will provide the system with that. So all the gaps are filled up. This is another law which is exclusive, which is unique. Uh, in the world of uh, of cognitions, this is not a this is not an ordinary thing. This is not just an ontological rule which applies to the reality. There is no gap in a cognition. There is no incomplete cognition. If all all the aspects are not captured, then somehow the system would supply the 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 the, the, the cognition with uh, with contents. Now, what happens when I see uh, I look at Y, which looks like X, and I cannot capture the special features of Y. What happens in this case is, uh, somehow I remember X, and the, the, the memory itself becomes a connection. We'll see that in a pictorial form, what happens. So here is an analysis. So there is a pair, and uh, somebody, somebody, somebody's eye gets connected with that pair and we analyze here the pair which is something and then that has pairness right so uh, so the first connection that is some yoga sandhikarsha and some some yoga sandhikarsha captures the qualificant of it suppose that has been captured as this this object right something just something at the next level the next connection that is contacted inherence tries to get uh, established but somehow it can't uh, maybe the the place is not well lit. Maybe the the environment does not support the cognitive system to capture this very special pop property here, which is pairness. Somehow this is not captured. When this is not captured, the cognitive system supplies the cognition with something. What is it? It remembers well something which looks like a pear, which is you know which is a general apple. So, so the property of it is appleness. So appleness is remembered and it just pops up. So it is invoked by, uh, by the, the very, the, you know, by the very understanding or the very awareness of the common properties of uh, maybe the apple and the pear. And then that itself, that cognition, that recollected cognition or the memory itself becomes a connection that connects the eye and the cognition and it reaches the cognition right the, here we are talking about two cognitions one this calling cloud which is the final resultant cognition and then this memory which is a second cognition which enters which penetrates now the the cognition the main cognition we are talking about now this is jnana lakshana pratyasati this connection is called jnana lakshana or the cognition only connection where the cognition itself is a connection and eventually they get connected because uh, uh, because nothing remains unconnected as I said here is an example of uh, the systems filling up the gap right so there was a gap in my in my capture because I couldn't capture the, I couldn't capture the property called pairness that's okay but then uh, as I said the system provides the cognition, this calling cloud, this big one, this cognition, with uh, another another piece, which is basically memory, and fills that property part up. Now, one very important point I want to make here, that is, look, there is nothing wrong with an illusion. The failure associated, or the defect associated with an illusion, is a practical defect, so to say, it will not lead you to a successful activity, granted. But that's a different thing. Epistemologically speaking, there is nothing wrong. Because, well, although this is not, this pairness is not captured, somehow appleness is captured, right? Appleness is captured and that, that is captured perfectly. Now the source is heterogeneous. So in the case of knowledge, the source is homogeneous. It would be just the world. But in the case of uh, an illusion, the source is heterogeneous. Part of it is taken from the real world and part of it is taken from the cognitive world. But not that. It's a wrong thing. There is nothing wrong about it. 
and finally they get connected. So there is no failure as such. There is no cognitive failure as far as an error or an illusion is concerned. Yes, there is a practical failure because if I want, if I want to taste an apple there after having seen this, I would not because th there is no apple, there is a pear, right? So this is basically the gross picture of it. So then we go to the last uh, part that is the, the perception of absence, which is a very, very important thing. So uh, a few things. So basically you can see that uh, here is a room and this is the ground of the room and, uh, and then here is a subject and the room does not have any apple on it, right? The, not the room, but rather the floor, the ground does not have any apple. So, and the subject cognizes, there is no apple on the ground. How is this cognition born? We are talking about that now. A few things we need to understand, uh, a few theoretical things here. So what is it we are talking about? We are talking about the ground, which has the absence of apples, right? Which means, that a general apple is the counterpositive pratyogin, the absentee of the absence. General apple, it is not about a specific apple, it is just apple. There is no apple at all, right? So we would denote the absence of apples as this, as this. This is the negation sign, that is the, here in this case, the absence sign, and then the absence of what? The absentee will be presented in the, in the bracket. Let us uh, sort of uh, let us stick to this terminology or this uh, symbolism for some time. Now, the counterpositive, the absentee, in this case, apples, has counterpositiveness, which is uh, property, pratyogitva. You see, we need not now talk about apples. We can go to the next level of, of abstraction. We can talk about, we can reach the level of appleness and talk about it. So, so how do we do that? We can do that by reaching the level of dharma, the abstraction, right? Now, what we are saying, once again, we paraphrase. We are saying that on the ground, there is nothing having appleness through the relation of contact, right? How to write this in the technical language of Nyaya? We are basically saying that in apple, there is the counterpositiveness, pratyogitva, or absentiness, and this absentiness is, is, is limited by two factors. One, appleness, because there is nothing which has appleness, and contact, because there is nothing in contact. There is nothing, uh, there is no apple in contact uh, with the ground, right? So there is not, basically you are saying that there is nothing which is limited on, on the ground. There is nothing which is limited by both. Basically, this is a rough way of speaking about that. But then basically you are saying there is something uh, which has uh, a counterpositiveness, means the absentiness uh, with respect to the absence we talked about. And then that absentiness is limited by appleness and contact. Now you are saying the ground has the absence, which is determined, so the pratyogita, the counterpositiveness determines an absence, like the qualifierness used to determine qualificantness. Same thing. So the, the ground has an absence that is determined by a counterpositiveness, which in turn is limited by both appleness and contact. So here you describe the absence, and what kind of an absence? It is an absence having a specific counterpositiveness. What kind of a counterpositiveness? That which is limited by appleness and contact. See, once again, we represent an absence. Look at the very strong tendency of representing objects or cognitions or everything in the system. That makes the system uh, rigorous and, uh, and consistent. Now, the absence is an independent entity for the logician. Now, I personally do not agree with uh, this position. If I had time, I could talk about that. Uh, I would argue against it. I did in one of my papers. I argued against it, but let us now accept what the Nayaika would say. So, uh, many logicians believe that uh, an absence is a separate entity over and above 
the locus of it. So if you enumerate things in the world, you would also enumerate absences, right? If you enumerate uh, things that are here on the screen, you would enumerate uh, the pictures of elephants, for example, because there is no picture of elephant on the screen, right? So the absence of the pictures of elephants would be a thing uh, which is there on the screen. So that is how, that is the independence of it, right? Now uh, we would uh, represent it pictorially. So there is an absence of apple on the ground and uh, this is the ground and somebody, the subject uh, gets to know that uh, there is no apple on the ground, there is the absence of apple on the ground. In this case, the absence of apples becomes the qualifier, the visheshana, and the ground becomes the qualificant. That is very easy to understand. Now, what happens is a contact, once again, is established between the ground and the eye of the subject. Following that, the next level uh, Sanikarsha is born, which is called contacted qualifierness, because now it's a it's a connection between uh, between the eye and a qualifier, and at the same time it is going through contact, right? So it is contacted qualifierness, Sanyukta Visheshanata. Visheshana means qualifier, and as a result of that, uh, this subject cognizes there is no apple on the ground. There is a there is another step which we didn't mention. That is, uh, this person should have thought of an apple. Then only this person should have uh, sort of uh, should should have done all these things. Because not that you see a ground and all the time you think there is no apple on this on this ground, right? It doesn't happen that way. Before that, you need to think about apples. But finally. This is the analysis of it. So we have seen a few representations. We have studied them, not only representations. Also, we have seen how the representations are processed almost in a mechanical manner and how as as results of that, we have perceptions of different kinds. We have illusions of different kinds and uh, and stuff like that. So thank you. Uh, we This is the end of this session. In the next session, we'll talk about reasoning and inference. Thank you very much.